Uh, greetings, this is Mike Billington. I'm with the Executive Intelligence Review in the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche Organization. I'm here today with Dr. Clifford Kirikoff. Uh, uh, Cliff served as a senior staff member on the uh, Senate Committee on Foreign Relations uh, during the 1980s. Uh, he's taught in universities in the United States, in China. He's a prolific writer on historic uh, historical and, and strategic and economic issues. So uh, thank you, uh, Cliff, for, for being with us today. Uh, do you want to say anything else about your own history? No, oh, thanks, Mike, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Okay. Um, the um, the uh, In 2005 and 2006, you uh, you gave several presentations at Schiller Institute conferences in uh, in Germany as well as in the U.S. Uh, several of them on the theme of U.S. imperialism and the rise of the national security state, and generally on the emergence of a fascist tendency within the United States. This was this was the time after the 9/11 attack, the Patriot Act the beginning of the endless wars in Afghanistan and Iraq under George Bush and Dick Cheney. Now, what, what is your view of that era today? Well, that was very significant. 9-11, uh, of course, changed everything. And 9-11 provided a pretext uh, for uh, increasing uh, the national security state, if you will, here in the United States and uh, a clamp down on uh, Liberty uh, here, and uh, I think um, an interference uh, with our, our constitutional rights. So 9-11 was really a key. I can certainly remember and visualize uh, the attack on the Twin Towers. So that stunned America, and using that horrible event, uh, <laughs> the powers that be uh, took advantage of a public uh, outrage and fear and uh, uh, continued uh, the construction of the uh, national security state that of course was uh, left over from the uh, Cold War, uh, the original Cold War from 1945 to say 1988, 89, when uh, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev kind of uh, ended the Cold War. Uh, so uh, the 9-11 revamped and provided context for this national security state. And of course, in recent, that was 15 years ago, in recent years, you have an addition of the surveillance state, uh, which is actually manipulated by uh, so-called Silicon Valley people. So you have the social media, et cetera, et cetera, all falling under the uh, national security state's uh, cognitive warfare, uh, propaganda, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in answer to your question, I think that early period, 2001, 2005, 6, uh, has set the stage uh, for the last 20 years of uh, increasing uh, this national security state uh, here at home and, uh, and globally, actually. Even then, uh, I, I noticed in looking over your, your presentations, then you, you rejected the idea of the unipolar world, uh, which had been promoted by uh, Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and the neoconservatives, the so-called Wolfowitz doctrine, right. which claimed that we had reached the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama put it, that liberal democracy was the proven doctrine for all nations, for all time, um, what, what was, in your view, what did they really mean by this term liberal democracy, which we still hear all the time today as the justification for the Western rules-based order? Well, I think if you look carefully back at that uh, era, uh, you'll see uh, among the neoconservatives, one uh, outspoken uh, intellectual, uh, Mike Ledeen, uh, talked about uh, universal fascism. And the concept was, well, early Mussolini, that is to say, uh, fascism without anti-Semitism, which Mussolini later uh, introduced into Italian fascism. Uh, 
So for the neocons, for Mike Ledeen and the neocons, this kind of uh, regime uh, is they're comfortable with. Uh, and looking at the intellectual roots of uh, the neoconservatives, really what you're looking at here is uh, uh, what, what was called revisionist Zionism. These people are all from the Truman Cold War era mentality. And uh, revisionist Zionism of Jabotinsky, which in turn, Jabotinsky favored uh, a Mussolini style politics and at base Nietzschean, uh, we could say Nietzschean approach to politics. So <clears throat> when they use the word liberal democracy, well, that sounds great. Uh, it sounds excellent uh, <laughs> until you realize that what they really mean is uh, quite the opposite, more of a regimented society, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so, uh, it's this use of use of language or twisting language around. Of course, liberal democracy would be great, but, but that's not what's in their, their mind. And of course, here in the United States, we have a constitutional republic. So our democracy is based on a constitution and it's a Republican in nature. There, there's uh, no difference these days between the um, the neocons who run the Republican Party and the so-called neo-libs uh, who run the Democratic Party when it comes to asserting the right to use military force against any government which does not follow their, quote, rules-based order, as they define the rules. The, uh, the endless wars in the Middle East were unprovoked uh, and, uh, and were supporting the terrorists rather than fighting them against sovereign governments. You've made the point that the U.S. lost all of these wars while causing uh, massive destruction and death and mass migration. Um, the U.N. Charter following World War II was very clear in forbidding the use of military force unless attacked and also forbid the use of unilateral sanctions for economic or strategic purposes. So how do you think the U.S. government has gotten away with such overt uh, criminal acts against international law? Well, Washington just plows ahead and does what it does what it wants. The so-called uh, blob or the inside the Beltway people, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, and um, both political parties have been uh, neoconized, if you wish. Uh, actually, the neoconservatives started in the Democratic Party under Truman, you know, that Cold War atmosphere. And nowadays, uh, the neoconservative. Uh, you know, bellicose, uh, aggressive line is uh, shared to a great uh, degree by both political parties uh, in Washington, in, in Congress. Um, in terms of interventionism, uh, again, both parties are involved in, in the neoconservative um, policy network, uh, the liberal interventionists that you mentioned, um, et cetera, the so-called human rights people, human rights interventionists. Um, and it's a disregard for international law, that is to say, traditional international law uh, based on the concept of sovereign states and also based on the concept of non-interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states. Now, this international legal concept goes back even as early as 1555 to the Peace of Augsburg, and then 1648 to the well-known uh, Peace of Westphalia. So these principles of non-interference uh, in the internal affairs of other countries um, is a 500-year-old principle, although it's not, of course, I've been <laughs> followed all those years. Uh, but the United States since World War II is kind of a prime uh, example of uh, what we would call interventionist politics and the in foreign interventions are supported by both parties or a majority of both parties. Um, and when it comes to these major wars as opposed to the covert coup d'etats and all sorts of covert actions, when it comes to the major wars, uh, we certainly didn't win Korea, uh, we didn't win Vietnam, uh, we didn't win uh, Iraq and ignominious uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, et cetera. Uh, 
And of course, we're not going to quote unquote win the proxy war the US started with uh, Russia in, in the Ukraine. So we have a lot of violence going on and uh, displaced persons, deaths, et cetera, et cetera, owing to this interventionism or what we could call imperialism um, by the United States and its Western allies. I would point out that the NATO alliance, we need to remember that it's, <clears throat> it's both US, Canada plus Western European countries. And it's really, um, uh, the product of, of a US or transatlantic oligarchy. So what we're really looking at here is a transatlantic oligarchy uh, rather than individual United States or individual Germany or France or England or something. It's, it's this transatlantic oligarchy that is uh, controlling NATO and contr as a tool of policy. Uh, as an enforcement tool of policy and is controlling the European Union as a political uh, tool. So when we talk about US imperialism, uh, which is one way to look at it, we also should uh, bear in mind this sort of transatlantic uh, oligarchy, which is subservient to, uh, we could say a certain plutocracy, you know. And how do you see the role of the city of London and Wall Street in, in uh, the governance of this transatlantic oligarchy? Well, gee, that, that's the core of it. Um, that's the core. And of course, this, this, the city of London is, is, is a, a very ancient um, setup. Uh, I mean, going back many centuries, I think uh, maybe to the 13th century or a little later, but you know, at least five, 600 years um, going back that far. And of course you have the, the Bank of England that was uh, started as a private monopoly about uh, in the late 1600s, 1690s. Uh, and that whole uh, private banking and banking nexus is there in what is called the city with a capital T and a capital C. Uh, so that's the British component of it. And then we have the American side in Wall Street. Um, and, and that's kind of a, um, you could say a, a parallel universe or a parallel and cooperating um, mechanism or financial mechanism with the British. So what you do have is what people used to, the Anglo-Dutch banking uh, financial networks and then the New York well, linkages, uh, uh, New York uh, commercial banks, et cetera, et cetera, investment banks. And then that, well, they're all kind of interlinked and each has offices in the other countries. So the New York banks have offices in London and the London banks have offices in New York, et cetera. And of course, you're looking at the central banks <clears throat> and the cooperation of central banks to manipulate uh, money supply and credit and interest rates and things along those lines. So you have, I would say, um, a misuse in a way of, of central banks. The British Bank of England was nationalized after World War II. The American Federal Reserve, so-called, I think is still held by uh, shares or held by uh, commercial banks. So the American Federal Reserve <laughs> isn't really federal when you uh, look at it closely. Um, also, there's a problem of so-called independence of central banks. Uh, the central bank should certainly be under the control of the treasury, not independent. Um, and the United States uh, Fed is not under the control of uh, the treasury or and is only nominally under control of Congress, which is too uh, supine to uh, reform it, let's say. So yes, uh, the, the finance capitalism, of course, is the root or foundation of um, <clears throat> modern Western imperialism. And uh, Professor Hobson in England way back in early 1900s uh, uh, wrote about it, analyzed it. Uh, a number of American economists back in the early 1900s uh, following Hobson and other analysts, economists uh, noted this problem of uh, what they used to call national imperialism. That is to say, uh, for example, World War I, you had the British imperialism, French imperialism, 
<clears throat> Russian imperialism, German imperialism. It was a clash of these national imperialisms. After World War II, <clears throat> we seem to have more of a, we might call a globalist imperialism. That is to say that the competing national imperialisms of the World War I era, even World War II, uh, something changed. And then after World War II, you had kind of a, 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 a globalist or, or a group, a, a global oligarchy or plutocracy uh, running the imperialist game. And of course, the US being the most powerful country after World War II, uh, the US became an instrument uh, for uh, projecting uh, military power or other sorts of power where necessary to uh, enforce, let's say, uh, the global finance, global finance capitalism. So the US becomes a sheriff for Wall Street and, um, <clears throat> and the city, actually. The British, of course, give the Americans a lot of ideas because the Americans don't have so much experience uh, as the British do. So a lot of US policies are actually uh, British policies that the British basically uh, suggest to the United States and then the United States um, goes forward with that, you know, anti-Russian stuff and, and all of that. Well, also financial policies uh, in the sense that the uh, historic American system of Hamiltonian economics had the government directing the, uh, the credit policy, not the Fed or the private banking system. Uh, and uh, with, with uh, essentially after the assassination of Kennedy, uh, this British model of banking systematically came in and generally took over the financial system. And, and all you hear since then is the independence of the Fed. We must protect the independence of the Fed, which, of course, is the independence of private bankers, not, not government policy. Right. As, as I said before, when, when the Federal Reserve was set up in 1913, I mean, the ownership of the Fed actually was the shareholder. The shareholders were, were the participating big banks. So it's, they just put the word federal on it. It's a private bank. And um, in essence, it's a private bank. And uh, as I said earlier, it actually it should be under the authority of the Treasury Department uh, and the uh, Secretary of the Treasury which would be a cabinet official with the president, et cetera. And of course, uh, the Fed was set up by Congress. So uh, Congress has the power to create the Fed and Congress has the power to dissolve the Fed or uh, put new legislation forward to uh, audit the Fed, to uh, change how it works, et cetera, et cetera. So the Fed is a creature of Congress. However, as you w well point out, the idea that um, the Fed should be quote unquote independent. What does that mean? Independent from Congress? Well, what does that mean? Independent from the people of the United States who vote for their Congress uh, persons, uh, senators and, and, and uh, congressmen? I mean, what is an independent American central bank? Who, who, who own? And if you take a look carefully during the Jacksonian period of the central bank, you do find that there were foreign shareholders of our own central bank. So uh, the issue then is, uh, OK, uh, let's nationalize the federal central bank and let's put it under the authority of the Treasury Department, Secretary of the Treasury, who, of course, is subject to his, uh, his president and his pre president is subject to election. Uh, therefore, uh, we, we certainly don't need an independent Fed. We need a Fed under uh, political control. And uh, of course, uh, you may say, well, the different politicians are going to have different ideas. Well, fine, that's democracy. Let's have a vote in the Senate. Let's have a vote in the House about uh, management issues when it comes to the central bank. Uh, why let this, this sort of high priest uh, who would be the head of the central bank, well, why let that high priest uh, make all the policies uh, without regulation without oversight. And of course, the appropriate, the banking committee and appropriate committees in the House and Senate are supposed to exercise oversight, but they just write a blank check. And then so the high priests, high priests and priestesses in the uh, 
uh, central bank. Um, you know, you can kind of think about Delphi and ancient Babylon and, and all those ancient times when, you know, the, the, all the money, the gold and the silver was kept in, in the, by the priesthood in, in the temples, you know. So uh, these high priests of the Federal Reserve uh, are independent. They're not subject to democratic control. So my personal view is that we, we need to federalize the Fed and bring it under a democratic control of Congress uh, uh, who have the authority and the responsibility uh, of oversight. I mean, look at the interest rates today, look at the Fed policy. It's a disaster, it's wrecking the country. Thank you. Um, so let, let me, you, you mentioned the Ukraine situation. Let me go back to that. It's. Um, it's widely recognized now. Uh, I don't think they can hide it any longer that the U.S. and the U.K. have been openly sponsoring and arming neo-Nazi brigades uh, within Ukraine, within the Ukraine military and within the government. Um, I know you know a great deal about how the fascist institutions from World War II, the Nazi and fascist institutions, that these were sustained by Western interests uh, in Europe since the time of, uh, of, of World War II. What, what can you say about how that was done? Well, first of all, let's, uh, let's uh, go back a little bit into the 1920s and 1930s uh, when we have uh, various forms of fascism developing. And uh, we, we have that particularly virulent anti-Semitic strain of fascism uh, developing, of course, in Germany, but then Mussolini shifts over and, and uh, becomes also anti-Semitic in his uh, later period, I think after 37 or whatever. So the roots uh, of this go back into the, uh, the racist or racial roots, go back into what used to be called eugenics and uh, racial anthropology as uh, scientific so-called subjects of study. So eugenics, uh, racial anthropology, et cetera, et cetera, which even goes back into the late 1880s, uh, uh, Ratzenhofer in Austria and the others. But, but that sets the stage for that era of fascism that we supposedly defeated in World War II. But we have a persistence of the Ideolo racist ideologies or racialist ideologies of the racial anthropologists and the eugenics people and the anti-Semites and all of that, we have that persisting in various quarters in Europe. Europe was not denazified. I mean, in theory, Germany was denazified, but uh, so really the, the ideology that pernicious ideology, uh, racist, racialist ideologies um, were, were never fully extinguished and, and, and they persisted under, under the table, you could say, and even protected under dem democracy, democratic institutions, which allow a variety of thought, although the Nazi thought, et cetera, is pernicious, but still it, it, it survived. And uh, uh, in particularly in Eastern Europe uh, and parts of Germany, et cetera. So when we look at Ukraine situation, uh, we need to take a look at the historical background. First of all, um, Ukraine was, translate the word translates to borderland and the present geographic space of Ukraine, the present borders are like a Frankenstein monster. Bits and pieces of territory were added to create Ukraine. This was after, particularly after, during World War I, 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, where the German general staff made a deal with Lenin and uh, therefore Russia dropped out of the war and in return, uh, Ukraine was, quote unquote, was created uh, and various parts of the Russian, former Russian empire were broken off. And then Lenin gives 
uh, the whole southern and eastern portion, Novorossiya, historic Novorossiya, to so-called Ukraine in 1922. And then after World War II, Stalin gives little portions of, of what's now in Western Ukraine uh, to Ukraine. And former Polish Galicia, there's 2 million Poles that live in Ukraine, uh, former Austrian land before that uh, is involved in what's the present day boundaries of Ukraine. So Ukraine is a mishmash and an agglomeration of various pieces of real estate and ethnic and religious nation, religious groups. The Western part is Roman Catholic. The Novorossiya area is generally um, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. So you have within Ukraine, um, ethnic, uh, as well as religious divisions. Now, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, etc., particularly in the western portion of Ukraine near Lvov and the western portion of Ukraine, what is today called Ukraine, you have the rise of Nazi organizations, various organizations, Ukrainian organizations that worked with the German state, the Nazi German state, with the Abwehr in particular, the military and others. So this is where the Bandera, Stepan Bandera faction comes from. The Stepan Bandera political faction today is the dominant political faction in Ukraine. Now, what about this guy? Bandera was uh, worked with, was a Nazi agent. He worked with the Germans in World War II. His organization was responsible for murdering Jews and Poles and Ukrainians, et cetera, et cetera, uh, liquidating them, um, over 100,000 or so. So the Bandera operations in World War II were directed by Nazi Germany as he was their tool. So uh, at the conclusion of World War II, uh, the Nazi German intelligence network under General Reinhard Galen was <laughs> recruited uh, by the West, by the United States, et cetera, uh, to, to, to fold into post-World War II Western intelligence services to fight communism, that is to say Russian uh, communism or Soviet communism, Soviet bloc communism. So you have folded into West NATO, for example, Western intelligence services, for example, uh, former Nazi military and intelligence officials uh, with the idea of fighting communism, so use the Nazis to fight the commies, blah, blah, that kind of an idea. And in that, you had different operations created in Europe, like the so-called Gladio operation, which uh, left a lot of stay-behind networks of uh, basically Nazi-type ideological types uh, in place under cover in, in Europe uh, to fight against the so-called uh, Soviet threat and so on. So uh, how, how does this persist? Well, it, it starts in the 1920s and 30s. World War II does not denazify uh, Europe, really. And then after World War II, these extremist networks are used uh, by the West, by US and Germany and Britain and France, et cetera. These, these networks are used, NATO, are used against the Soviet Union. Now, when the Soviet Union breaks up in 1991, right, end of the Warsaw Pact, end of the Soviet Union, what happens is the Soviet Union breaks into pieces and you have the Russian Federation, which is the major part, Russia, and then uh, all these bits and pieces of what was the Soviet Empire which was an inherited part of the Tsarist empire. So the Baltic states were freed up and uh, Ukraine became uh, independent. 
and the Central Asian countries, the stands, the five stands uh, became independent. With reference to Ukraine, these old uh, Bandera networks, uh, some of the elderly people still existed uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and then their children and grandchildren who adhered to that uh, form of Ukrainian nationalism uh, exist, existed in Ukraine, particularly in the Lvov area in the Western Roman Catholic zone of, of Ukraine. Their ethnic concept, like Hitler, their ethnic concept was ethnically anti-Russian. So the both the both Slavs, that's true, but but the, the Ukrainian racial anthropology made a distinction between themselves as superior to the uh, Russian ethnic people who were, uh, in German terms, the Untermenschen or the you know the, the lower down people. So that that the distinction in Ukraine was maintained in the fifties and the sixties and, and by these extremist groups. And uh, in recent years, uh, since 1991, uh, Western intelligence services, you know, the United States, Britain, Germany in particular, uh, were using these uh, anti, earlier, 1950s, earlier anti-communist networks. And then uh, the, they were used in turn to impose the coup d'etat in 2014, the so-called Maidan coup. That, that really put in power uh, these really extremist people. Before the Maidan coup, we could say that the governments were pro-Western, uh, but more liberal, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Yushchenko and all, so a more liberal pro-Western. But after the 2014 coup, Poroshenko and Zelensky, these are, these are very, uh, right-wing nationalist uh, neo-Nazi Nazi networks that have real power uh, in the parliament and in the government nomenclature, the apparatus of government, the bureaucracy, and also in the military. So that's what we're facing right now um, in the Ukraine. And of course, uh, the Ukrainian situation, the tragic war that we see now could have been avoided by the West uh, uh, pressuring Ukraine to adopt the Minsk II formula, which was from 1915, 2015. And the Minsk II formula simply called for more autonomy for the ethnic Russian speakers, uh, ethnic Russians in the South and East, former Novorossiya. But Neither France, nor Germany, nor the United States, nor any of the Western countries wanted to, just would uh, help facilitate Minsk II. And that being the case, uh, the Western countries also, NATO, built up the Ukrainian military and backed the new right-wing regimes in Ukraine uh, I mean, Zelensky is a fascist and Poroshenko was too. I mean, it was very simple, but at any rate. Uh, so Ukraine was built up as a proxy, NATO proxy, US proxy against Russia. Now, of course, this was part of the Brzezinski formula. If you remember how Brzezinski wrote his book, uh, The Grand Chessboard, uh, Brzezinski was the guy who in invented these color revolutions for Georgia, the country of Georgia, for the country of Ukraine, et cetera. So this is really Brzezinski's uh, legacy in a way, uh, in a direct way, uh, this Ukraine war, because Brzezinski uh, specifically uh, wanted to target Ukraine as a, as, a, as a proxy against Russia. And of course, Madeleine Albright under Clinton, et cetera, Madeleine Albright was the former student and protege of, of Brzezinski. So therefore Albright, uh, and those people uh, followed his suggestion about promoting uh, color revolutions in, in Georgia and in Ukraine and et cetera. 
thus <laughs> we've arrived at a situation where Russia, which tried a diplomatic initiative in December 17th with the US and with NATO to try to resolve the situation by diplomacy, those initiatives were rejected by Washington and by NATO. Thus, the Russians felt that come February when intensified bombing and shelling of the Donbass region was occurring and 60 or 70 or 80,000 um, Ukrainian troops were massed at the borders there. Uh, they felt that they had to intervene under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, which allows for such an intervention um, if requested and the Donbass republics requested the intervention. So without going into even further length about the situation, uh, right now, you know, the, the Russians are advancing and Ukraine will be uh, partitioned uh, if the Russian advance sticks and uh, Russia will get back uh, what Lenin gave to Ukraine, that is uh, traditional Novorossiya in the south and east. And there'll be a Ukrainian rump state. And then the question is gonna be, is Poland gonna to want to grab a little bit of Galicia back? Well, what about Hungary, uh, et cetera? So the ultimate shape geographic space of Ukraine is yet to be determined. Um, certainly the US, uh, any, any military professional knows that the Russians are winning, but the propaganda has to be the other way around, uh, that the Ukrainians are winning, et cetera, et cetera, the brave Zelensky, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, the fact on the ground certainly appears to be that the Russians are winning and ultimately will partition uh, Ukraine. Yeah. So let me let me ask you about the ideology behind fascism. Um, as I'm sure you know, as a university professor for years, uh, the the likes of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Martin Heidegger of the jurist Carl Schmitt. These people are taught as among the great philosophers and jurists uh, of our age in American universities. And yet these are the ideologues who really gave rise to German Nazism. So how do you see this? Well, it's a tragedy, of course. Instead of teaching uh, Nietzsche and, and uh, Heidegger and Schmitt and all those guys, we should be teaching you know, James Madison and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, you know, our own intellectual tradition. What we've done is adopted the European uh, uh, intellectual tradition, which has nothing to do with the United States uh, in these characters. And that has become uh, proliferated in American education. I will say that uh, in particular, What's been uh, devastating has been, I think, the Frankfurt School uh, of German uh, intellectuals who came to the United States in the 1930s and set up shop at Columbia University. And the Frankfurt School, of course, is critical theory. And it's a, a mixture of neo-Marxism and um, neo-Freudianism. But really, what people don't quite catch is that the Frankfurt School really is fundamentally based on Nechayev, the Russian anarchist. And Nechayev's doctrine was one of pure destruction. Uh, and that goes well with Nietzsche, of course, but Nechayev's doctrine was destruction. And the Frankfurt School's entire program was the destruction of Western culture, thus politics. So destroy culture, you destroy politics. Um, and that's the Frankfurt School approach. And uh, I remember very well a college, university campus 
in the 60s when I was a student, undergrad, uh, you had, you know, you had these uh, Frankfurt School professors uh, becoming so famous. Herbert Marcuse, for one, uh, and and a, and a whole host of others, uh, the Frankfurt School people were dominating uh, campuses from California all the way to New England. Uh, so it was this Marcuse and and Frankfurt School and et cetera. And if you take a look at their ideology, it's, it's, it's a brilliant uh, strategy uh, to destroy. They, they make no proposals as to what to build. Their role is to destroy. And it's so funny that the Frankfurt School itself was a creation of the uh, Soviet intelligence services, the NKVD. Felix Dzerzhinsky himself worked with Adorno directly to fund and put together the Frankfurt School. And uh, there was a close linkage then between the Frankfurt School and Moscow Center and the Frankfurt School and the Comintern, the Communist International. And in, in Russia, you had Radek and some of the others who were linked into uh, helping support the Frankfurt School in Frankfurt, Germany, this group of neo-Marxist, et cetera, intellectuals. Now, what about Nietzsche? What we find about Nietzsche, the trend uh, in the late 19th century, uh, particularly in Germany, there was, uh, I, would, I would say a revival, you could call it, or a wave of Nietzschean uh, thought. Nietzsche became very, very influential, 1880s, 1890s. At the same time, this strong Nietzschean impulse was linked, you could say, to the Darwin people, uh, the Herbert Spencer people, uh, so you had kind of a convergence of Nietzsche and this uh, social Darwinism, or however you want to phrase it, survival of the fittest, that philosophy. And that was a driving force uh, in Germany as well as in England, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was, there was a transformation into the military ideology particularly by General Ratzenhofer of Austria, who blended this Nietzschean stuff with this racial stuff, a survival of the fittest stuff of Darwin and Spencer. And uh, Ratzenhofer really, I think, uh, in certain circles was influential. And let's remember, Hitler was an Austrian. Hitler wasn't a German at all. Hitler was an Austrian. And I think Ratz General Ratzenhofer's ideas provided a real basis uh, for, for Hitler and uh, that type of uh, militarized uh, uh, Nietzschean uh, thought and action. So yes, you've identified Nietzsche, it's very important. Um, and when we look at what, what used to be called militarism, the rise of militarism in Europe in the 19th century, again, toward the end of the 19th century, that militarism was very much colored by Nietzschean, uh, the Superman, the Nietzschean thought. Now, we fought, we, we fought World War I and tried in World, after that with the League of Nations and then World War II and tried after that with the United Nations to, to try to stem or stop or block or eliminate this uh, virulent militarism. Uh, that was tearing the world up. And that includes, of course, Japanese militarism. I'm not letting them off the hook either, but, uh, or Mr. Abe. But um, this militarism was kept going in the United States after World War II, as Ike Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, by the military industrial complex. And who 
are a leading intellectual network, policy network for that, the neoconservatives. So today in why so this what you the point you make on on philosophy driving uh, thought in the United States, uh, yes, Nietzsche uh, and also Heidegger, but in particular uh, the Frankfurt School, and then we see the neocons pushing it. And then in the academic world, which has been com <laughs> completely wrecked by the Frankfurt School, we, we at higher education, not to mention K through 12, but and in higher education, particularly in international relations theory, uh, international relations scholars, we see the so-called realists. Well, who, what is this realist stuff? Well, the realists, so-called in academics and in policy in Washington, the realists, I uh, believe in the philosophies of, of Nietzsche, Hobbes, and you didn't mention Leo Strauss, but Leo Strauss is in there as a purveyor of Nietzschean thought. Hans Morgenthau, another purveyor of Nietzschean thought. So in the National Security Network in the United States, we have uh, Nietzschean thought, Hobbesian thought, German realpolitik thought, mocked politik thought. Uh, and by the, by the way, the Friedrich Meinecke uh, critique of realpolitik is really good. His book on uh, Machiavellianism, um, on Staatswesen, is, is a very important book on all this. But uh, so permeating Washington, D.C. today, sitting in various offices in the Pentagon and State Department and co Congress and the, uh, et cetera, there's this national security thinking based on Hobbes. Well, the United States is not based on Hobbes, more Locke, Hobbes. Uh, and so the philosophy that what you point out about Nietzschean thought, it's not just confined to the uh, world of ivory tower intellectuals. No, variations of Nietzschean thought are, are present in the policymaking circles in Washington, D.C our imperialism, our uh, interventionism has an, is a Nietzschean, you know, the idea that the United States should be the hegemon of the world, the, should dominate the world, so-called full spectrum dominance. Uh, all this stuff that you see coming out of the Pentagon in their national security reports every couple of years, et cetera, uh, or, or national strategy reports um, out, of the, out of the White House, it has this Nietzschean flavor to it. And after 1951 in the NSC 68, which is a very famous document, the National Security Council prepared, NSC 68, 1951, that National Security Council document set the stage for the militarization of American foreign policy. You could say the Nietzscheization of American foreign policy, the Hobbes, Hobbesination or whatever. Certainly American foreign policy that the founding fathers intended as the George Washington's farewell address has nothing to do with Nietzsche or Heidegger or Leo Strauss or Carl Schmitt, who, who was Strauss's teacher. Um, so what's happened is this European fascism, the strain of European fascism and philosophy has come into the United States and has spread to the higher education, et cetera, and then spreads into decision makers in Washington. So they have this, what we can call roughly a Cold War mindset, a Nietzschean mindset, a zero sum yeah. mindset. We had another shift in strategy during the Obama and Trump administrations when our national security doctrines uh, declared that terrorism was not our key problem, but rather uh, we now have great power confrontation and that Russia and China were identified as our competitors, basically actually saying that they were our enemies, that they were aggressive, they were trying to take the world away from America's uh, unipolar leadership and so forth. 
Um, and yet just last week, we had a meeting of the BRICS countries, uh, Russia, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, along with 13 other leading developing sector countries who met in a BRICS conference uh, in Beijing. And uh, they absolutely, they united totally in denouncing the idea of these blocks of the East versus the West, of the what the, uh, what the Biden administration likes to call the democracies versus the autocracies. Um, and instead they called for international unity to deal with the actual global crisis that we're facing, a, a perfect storm as Helga Zepp LaRouche calls it. Uh, the danger of a global nuclear war, the hyperinflationary collapse of the entire dollar-based Western system, mass famine spreading in an unprecedented scope globally, uh, and yet the, the Biden administration and the media continue to say that Russia is isolated internationally and even that China is isolated internationally, despite this reality. So what, what is the actual situation now in terms of the emergence of this new phenomenon in the West, in uh, China, Russia, India? Uh, yeah, and I, I, you've identified that uh, really well, the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India. China, South Africa, uh, grouping. Uh, what we're seeing is these different groupings. We have ASEAN in, in the Pacific, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the groupings of countries uh, around common interests, which boil down to economic and social development and cooperation. So here we have this concept of uh, peace and development, or and development meaning economic and social, scientific, technological uh, development of humanity. So I'm an American and I'm really outraged at not just the Biden administration, it's, it's the entire US establishment, the foreign policy establishment. They've completely uh, divorced themselves from let's say George Washington's farewell address. Or, or you could take Jefferson or Hamilton or Madison or Monroe or any of the, or Abraham Lincoln, any of the founding fathers and a, astute statesmen of our past uh, and have taken a, a American idealism and have created the absolute opposite, um, the American, uh, imperial hegemon, um, kind of this Frankenstein monster roaming around the world. Uh, and as an American, I, I reject that. Uh, I think it's an alien idea to us, to our culture, our country, our people. And this alien idea is imposed by the establishment, the so-called transatlantic oligarchy, uh, submissive to a certain plutocracy of finance. So what we're seeing now in the world, of course, is a natural reaction. And even if you took uh, International Relations 101, which I used to teach uh, in, in political science classes, uh, you would see the concept of uh, countries getting together to balance against the hegemon. <laughs> you know, in Europe, you had uh, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, who wants to be the uh, ruler of Europe. Well, a coalition uh, was put together to block, block that. Uh, then you had uh, Napoleon. He wants to dominate Europe uh, and be the hegemon of Europe. Well, you have a coalition that comes together and, and blocks uh, uh, Napoleon. Then you got uh, Hitler uh, doing the same thing wanting to be the dictator of Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And again, a coalition comes together and defeats Hitler. So the pattern, at least in Western history, which is what we're talking about here, is, uh, is co coalitions coming together to block uh, a hegemon. Now, let's apply that to the world today. Uh, because the United States has entered into this completely un-American hegemonic role, uh, which is, let's face it, it, it's Wall Street, it's the city, you know, uh, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, who's really behind American imperialism? Well, Wall Street, of course, and the city. Uh, who's behind the 
military industrial complex. Well, of course, it's Wall Street. They make the loans to the companies. So this is what we call finance capitalism and combining with militarism. At any rate, uh, the BRICS countries uh, are now uh, trying their best to coordinate their policies toward economic and social development of their people. And this includes health and you know, all, all sorts of categories of, of social and economic development. And now what we have is uh, China and, and Russia in particular has emphasized the role of Putin himself, has emphasized the role of BRICS, uh, the emerging role of BRICS uh, in the international system. And the international system is changing um, from what? Well, let's take a look backwards. After World War II, the international system was two blocks, the Western bloc versus the communist bloc. The communist bloc was the Soviet Union and China, basically, and their satellites. So two blocks, the West versus the East. Then in 1991, the Soviet Union dissolves and the Warsaw Pact, its military alliance, dissolves. That left the US with choices to make. Back then, some of us argued, hey, now it's time to take a breather. Now it's time to prepare for the eventual emergence of a multipolar world. And uh, if we take a breather, uh, retrench our economy, uh, get our own economic and social development going because we're at peace, uh, we can uh, adjust to the inevitable, ineluctable arrival or process of multipolarity. Some call it um, polycentrism, some call it pluralism, however you want to, want to phrase it. But this idea of, and, and then along with that, you would have re-emphasized the United Nations as a central point for peace and development and international law. Of course, the United States has done just the opposite. We've done everything we can to destroy the United Nations, to wreck its mission, to destroy international law. Okay, so now that the world economy, more and more countries have reached an economic level uh, sufficient to sustain their independence and sovereignty, uh, particularly when protected or led by China and Russia, uh, you, you're, you're starting to see a global South emerging, BRICS part of that, and you're starting to see this Western uh, block of, uh, let's be frank, white people in uh, the US and Canada and Europe. So you've got this, this, this ra radical militarized Atlantic community of white people <laughs> versus the rest of the world. That's what's going on. It's a tragedy, it's a disgrace that the US establishment has, a, has, has supported and promotes this kind of a, a block system or bifurcation system of the world. Now, in 2005, you had a, the US establishment elite foreign policy elite met in a series of meetings Princeton University hosted, et cetera, et cetera. And it was to figure out an update to the Cold War. How, how do we update our Cold War policy? Uh, China is rising, Russia is coming back. Uh, we're mired down in the Middle East with the Iraq war. How do we update the Cold War? That was the question. New international situation, new international uh, balance of power, emergence or whatever. And the bottom line of that 2005 elite decision was the idea that you'd have democracies versus autocracies. Well, that just updates the language of the old Cold War, which was the West versus the East, the free world West versus the communist East. So it's this block idea, just updated with little different rhetoric, different language democracies versus autocracies. That's 2005. And that was, that, that was um, uh, carried 
carried forward, uh, we'll remember 2008, we had the election of Obama. So that, that consensus that had been reached just, just before the election, that 2008, that elite consensus was carried forward by Obama, who was the Secretary of State, Hillary, who was Hillary's chief advisor, a gal who had been uh, involved in this whole uh, update of US foreign policy, Marianne Slaughter, who was over at State Department and policy planning. So, so basically, we had the US elite, uh, so-called elite, as such as it is, uh, decided to update the Cold War to take into consideration the rise of China and the return of Russia. Still, the concept of containment uh, from the old Cold War was applied to the new Cold War. That is to say, beef up NATO in Europe to block Russia and strengthen alliance with Japan and other alliances in Asia to block China. Therefore, we have this idea of encirclement of, of the Eurasian landmass uh, from the European side and Japan and the Pacific side. That was already 2005 and carried into the Obama administration. And we can remember Mrs. Clinton talked about the, uh, she didn't call it the quad, but she discussed in 2011 and 2010, uh, as they were kind of uh, two years into the Obama administration, uh, Hillary was talking about, well, we're gonna have India and Japan, the United States, Australia, joined together against China. So that quad, as it was later called, at four countries, Hillary was already talking about that in 2010 and 11. So here we are in 2022. Now, <laughs> uh, let's think about this. You and I are both old enough to remember the 1970s. We were in college then, grad school, whatever. Back in 1972, Nixon did two things, the opening to China and a detente with uh, Russia, easing relations. So 50 years ago, half a century ago, a Republican, no less, conservative Republican administration, no less, was seeking ways to ameliorate relations with Russia and China. This was bipartisan because later in the late 1970s, President Jimmy Carter, we can well remember, uh, uh, sort of finalized the Nixon opening to China and achieved a normalization, you could say, of relations with China, late 1978-79. So here we are 50 years ago, attempting to have better relations with Russia and China. And uh, bipartisan, Nixon and Jimmy Carter, so both Democrats and Republicans. Well, now, let's fast forward. Here we are today, or since 2005, uh, with the rebirth of the Cold War stuff. So here we are today, back in the, what is it, 1950s with McCarthy? I mean, if you say something nice about Putin or President Xi, you're automatically a commie lover or a, a panda bear lover or, or a, a Russia bear lover or whatever you want to call it. So you have this McCarthyism going on right now against anyone who favors a, a, a responsible and reasonable policy toward other major powers. Now, there's, <laughs> there's, there's only two, two paths here symbolized on the back of a dollar bill with we have the great seal of America where the eagle is holding some olive branch and the eagle is holding uh, some uh, arrows. Now, in foreign policy, that's your choice. You're either gonna have peace with the olive branch or you're gonna have war with the arrows. And right now, instead of the peace seeking that Nixon and Jimmy Carter and others had, now we've got a neoconized Congress and a neoconized administration, Blinken, 
I mean, you know, Newland. I mean, come on. Uh, a neoconized administration, you know, fully backed by the military industrial complex. And the Pentagon, uh, people may not know it or understand it, but, but, but it's working overtime on war planning against China using Taiwan as the pretext. We're a little diverted right now with Ukraine, that's true. But what's really going on in the Pentagon behind the scenes is, is war planning against China over Taiwan. So here we have in 50 years gone from attempting to ameliorate, reduce tensions with potential adversaries, Russia and China, to the exact opposite. We are now in a confrontational mode with Russia and with China. And both of those countries are much stronger by far than they were in 1972 or 78 and nine. Uh, Russia and China are formidable powers. And the world is changing. The international system is changing to multipolarity. That's what gives space for the BRICS you mentioned, groupings of countries who don't want to live under an American hegemony, full down, basically not, it's not really US, it's, it's a NATO hegemony. It's a the hegemony of the... Uh, transatlantic oligarchy, we can say, or, or London and Washington, however you want to phrase it, but countries that are in the global south, as it's called, who don't want to be under this system uh, and who want independent, uh, to be independent and in the sense that they'd like to choose their own political system, uh, their own economic uh, development uh, growth system. Uh, it may not be a pure a uh, Western model, but they'd like to be able to choose their own path to development, uh, to political development, economic development, social development, and not be bothered by uh, the hegemonic policies of the NATO countries. NATO is expanding globally, so let's also remember that. NATO is not just for Europe anymore. NATO is, has been for 30 years reaching into Central Asia, Afghan war, uh, Libya, uh, in, in Africa, and also incorporating Japan and New Zealand and par as partners. So NATO has been globalized. And NATO is the control mechanism of the transatlantic oligarchy and plutocracy that I was, that I was mentioning before. So it's certainly no surprise that BRICS is being uh, featured now as an alternative grouping and uh, other countries can join it. Uh, Saudi Arabia might like to join. Um, uh, you know, Argentina has asked, uh, inquired about joining. Uh, Brazil is a member, so why not Argentina? Uh, I think Mexico would be a great addition. Uh, Indonesia, fantastic addition. So um, BRICS, uh, which is particularly emphasized by uh, the Russians, Putin, but also uh, China, BRICS has great possibilities uh, as, as in terms of forming a, a community oriented toward economic and social development. And I think, <clears throat> I think it's going to expand. That's why they're starting now in the last year or so to talk about BRICS plus, plus other members. Uh, who? Well, as we just said, there are a range of members in the Global South that would be uh, great additions uh, to BRICS. And uh, BRICS can uh, certainly uh, uh, learn, uh, learn uh, uh, from the experience of uh, China and its development model, which has been so successful. Uh, Russia, which has been successful in uh, uh, <laughs> staving off uh, Western uh, sanctions, etc. Uh, and uh, and the BRICS has a lot of a lot of potential as a, as a cooperative grouping with a shared future. Uh, the, the key there is cooperation, solidarity, uh, human development, uh, peace. Those, those are the sort of the BRICS watchwords. Those, that's what, what BRICS is aiming at. Um, and, and as you know, sorry, as, no, as, as you know, Cliff, the Schiller Institute has held a series of, of international conferences under Helga Zeppler-Russ's uh, direction, leadership, uh, 
and uh, focused on the idea that we have to find a way to get the U.S. and the European countries not to go to war with Russia and China, but to sit down with Russia and China and deal with the actual uh, extreme crisis facing mankind with the collapse of the dollar-based system, the threat of nuclear war, the pandemics, the, the, the uh, famine and so forth. Uh, and we're now circulating a petition uh, which is calling for a ad hoc committee for a new Bretton Woods system, basically insisting that what's driving the war is the economic breakdown of the West and that the decision by some in the West that rather than putting their own system through reorganization, they'd rather go out and destroy Russia and China so there was no opposition to their continued hegemony. Um, the... Uh, uh, the, the danger that Helga Zeppler-Rusch has identified is that this new system, which we've just discussed around the BRICS and the BRICS Plus, if it, if it uh, remains only the non-Western countries, uh, then it, and there's still the two blocks, two financial systems, it's going to aggravate the danger of war rather than alleviate the danger of war. So the question that, that we are addressing with the petition and with our organizing is how do we bring the United States to see its actual self-interest in being part of the Belt and Road, the new Silk Road, the new BRICS Plus, to join in a policy for uh, peace through development? What, what do you think? I mean, you've been involved in American politics most of your life. Uh, how, what, what must be done to bring the U.S. to its senses and to join with this positive effort? Well, I think <clears throat> Helga and the Children's Institute um, really are leading the charge here intellectually on, on the issue. Uh, we, what we're seeing now, uh, currently, is this bifurcation process, the two blocks, uh, a Western block uh, and a, uh, let's say, Global South block. Uh, now, it's fine that the Global South develops and, and creates itself into a block or whatever, solidarity between the members, et cetera. But uh, Helga was quite right that eventually, who knows when, but eventually uh, we must have a, uh, uh, an understanding on a global level which is what the United Nations is all about, but, but we should have an understanding at the global level uh, on uh, an international economy, a global economy uh, that works for everyone. Uh, a global international system that works for everyone. We're all humans, this is a human race, what is, what is at stake here? So it's true that for the moment, maybe for the next, few years, we're going to see a, this bifurcation into blocks. That's true. We see it now. Uh, it's a natural reaction <clears throat> against the hegemon, the United States and Western Europe, transatlantic oligarchy and plutocracy. So this is normal, but we have to look ahead. How do we look ahead? We do exactly what Franklin Roosevelt did during World War II we look ahead to the aftermath of the conflict. We plan ahead. Uh, that's why uh, President Roosevelt, who was very astute in international economic matters, called for the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. That's you know a year or so prior to uh, victory in Europe and victory in Japan. So a year before, while we were still fighting. Now we knew, by then we knew we were gonna win. But, uh, uh, allies were going to win. But we wanted to, President Roosevelt wanted to start planning ahead because obviously after a world war, <clears throat> there's gonna be global economic chaos similar today, just as you, as you just pointed out, but we're headed into a situation of, well, we're in it, but we're headed into a more serious situation of global economic uh, chaos. Hyperinflation, of course, can have 
you know, depression. We could have a depression that lasts five to 10 years. I mean, a global, a serious global depression. Uh, I mean, a real one, like in the 1930s or worse. Uh, famine, as you just pointed out, et cetera. So what we need to do is we need to do exactly the model uh, that our American leadership under Roosevelt, which was bipartisan, by the way, he had some Republicans in the cabinet, in his cabinet, uh, in a bipartisan manner, uh, we should accept the fact that a new Bretton Woods arrangement is needed. There's going to be this kind of non-Western global South bloc with its own currency in some shape, manner, or form, and there'll be the U.S. dollar, and there'll be others, there's a euro, et cetera. So in answer to your question, adopt the Roosevelt model during World War II, plan ahead. Plan to get us out of this chaos because we're headed into chaos. Even Jamie Dimon, the head of the uh, bank and all of that, a famous Wall Street fellow said a hurricane is coming. Now here's a famous Wall Street fellow saying a hurricane is coming. The Bank of England is, is saying the same thing in its reports over the last several weeks. So a hurricane is coming. So now is the time to, exactly as the uh, Schiller Institute has proposed, uh, is the time to be thinking about or pre-thinking about the post storm, after this storm, after the hurricane. Uh, we need to get a global new Bretton Woods. And that would relate to essentially, you know, there's a lot of different things there, but it would relate essentially to, to the issue of the currencies, which are all gonna be bouncing all over the place. And um, the original Bretton Woods, and this is an important point here. The original Bretton Woods had the exchange rates of the currencies fixed. How were they fixed? They were fixed by the agreement between sovereign states. Aha. So here you have what we would call economic diplomacy, oh, diplomacy, economic diplomacy, and you have the representatives of sovereign states agree on fixed exchange rates and how to fix the level to fix. Now, that was destroyed, that, that was destroyed in the 1970s when you had so-called floating rates. Now, floating rates are determined by who? By currency traders in the big banks. Now, I myself uh, had some friends who were currency traders in New York and London. And one time I took a visit to New York and I said, hey, come on, uh, come on into our, our shop here. We'll, we'll, we'll spend, it, spend an hour or two with us while we're trading currencies. So here I am sitting in a major international bank in New York City in their currency trading room. And these guys are just moving, moving currencies. You know, there's a you know, 50 million here, 100 million there, and then it's buy, sell, buy, sell. Well, no, a floating, floating rates have nothing to do with sovereign countries. They turn over the, the valuation of the currencies to, <laughs> to the private banking industry. So I think my suggestion would be that in the new Bretton Woods, we return to the idea that sovereign states through economic diplomacy around the negotiating table, the sovereign states determine the rates of exchange. Now, if you take a look at our own American Constitution and the money clause in our Constitution, Congress coins the money and regulates the values thereof and of foreign money. Congress has the power to say, gee, you know, I think, I think the pound sterling uh, isn't worth a dollar point twenty. I think the euro isn't worth a dollar oh two nowadays. I think the euro is worth 98 cents. It's the power of the sovereign 
to determine and regulate the value of money and of foreign money that he's exchanging for. So not the money lenders in the temple where we know the biblical story. Well, that's the issue. Is it gonna be the money lenders in the temple or is it gonna be sovereign states? Well, that's, that's something that needs to be addressed when we're thinking about uh, structuring a, a new Bretton Woods. And I understand that the thinking of uh, uh, Serge Glaziev, uh, who I've met, a fascinating person um, in Russia, uh, and, and his colleagues at the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, have I've been working on concepts involving a basket of currencies for bricks or you know however however one would create a monetary instrument and value it and i think they are working on a concept i guess for bricks or bricks plus of some kind of a monetary unit uh, that would be based on um, commodities are based on something uh, uh, tangible. At any rate, that's why I think the uh, Glaziev and his team at the Russian Academy of Sciences are trying to figure out how to create something that has value, has, has, uh, that they can identify a number or, or, or quantity or how to, how, to, how to indicate that value. One Euro or one bricks, Brixo, whatever. So yeah, I, I think uh, we need to look ahead. And um, the model for me is, 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 is Roosevelt's uh, Bretton Woods and economic diplomacy by sovereign states. I think that's the key principle. The numbers and all that stuff, that's just a matter of negotiation. Right? That's all just negotiation. The, the key, is getting the countries, the sovereign states, the countries together at a conference like Bretton Woods and have economic diplomacy. Uh, negotiate uh, and have economic diplomacy. Let your technical people, et cetera, figure out the exchange rates and all of that. But, but the key principle here is international cooperation to stabilize the international economic situation and world economy. I mean, without <laughs> Without, without stay, we're gonna go through the hurricane. So we're gonna learn again, like we did in the 1930s. We're gonna go right through that again, it appears. So, um, so we should prepare now. I think it's a great idea for the Schiller Institute uh, to call for uh, preparing for a new uh, Bretton Woods. Will the US join? Well, eventually you're gonna to have to, I mean, you can't, the US cannot be out of it forever. Uh, the two blocks cannot exist forever. 100 years? No. 50 years? No. 25 years? Maybe. 20 years? Maybe. Five years? Yeah. 10 years? Yeah. But at some point, probably less than 20 years, maybe even 15, at some point, there's going to have to be an international uh, cooperation uh, on all this. And uh, the dollar system, that is to say, the use of the American dollar or the treasury bills as your reserve, that's going to go out the window. Uh, there's going to be, there is a de dollarization going on right now. So you're going to enter into a new monetary system. And whether you have two separate monetary systems for a while, at some point, you're gonna to need to have uh, agreement among all the trading countries, uh, all, all, all the countries engaged in international commerce. And you'll have different types of additional reserve currencies. And, but that again, gets you into the whole issue, a separate issue of the organization or reorganization of central banks. Uh, and that's a, that's a whole nother issue aside from a monetary conference there's the issue of central banks. And I think the proper concept there <clears throat> broadly for international finance is finance 
banking, finance, should serve industry, right? Like a servant. Finance should serve industry. What we have today is the in inverse of that. Industry is serving finance. It's the slave of finance. So finance is at the top of the pyramid and all the slaves, you know, are, are and that's based on debt, usury and other typical methods of uh, the financial community. So uh, central banks are gonna have to be uh, rethought as well. And the relationship between central banks is gonna have to be uh, rethought. Thank you, Cliff. Um... Uh, of course, the Hamiltonian idea of national banking as opposed to central banking, uh, national banking actually being run by elected representatives rather than the private banks is, is one of the ideas that we're, we're fighting to introduce through what we call the Russia's four laws. Uh, well, let us hope that your idea of, of, of uh, bringing about this Bretton Woods conference uh, together with what the Schiller Institute is doing to with the petition, which I encourage everybody who's watching this to sign. You can go to the schillerinstitute.com and, and sign that petition. But uh, let us make sure that this happens before certain madmen uh, uh, walk ourselves uh, into a nuclear war. So the urgency of making this happen is something that uh, is now, I think, before the human race. I think people recognize that this is a turning point in history one way or the other, uh, and that these sane approaches, as you've laid out and as we've been fighting for, uh, are, are, are successful. So thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely uh, be circulating these ideas and, and your work here along with uh, the rest of our mobilization, and I want to thank you for participating in this. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me, and uh, best wishes to all of our viewers.